All right, so uh, today what we do is uh, we look at, uh, uh, we were looking at logic families. We are not done with it. Uh, uh, we'll have an extra lecture tomorrow. Uh, what we'll do instead is, uh, time is short, and so what I wanted to do today is uh, 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 is sort of try and integrate some of the things that we have learned, uh, so that you get a picture of uh, what a full chip uh, design looks like, okay? And, and then we'll come back to our regular discussion here. All right, so the, the topic of discussion is, you'll see why we are calling it uh, flow planning. Flow planning is an important activity in overall chip design. So let's start by seeing what we have done. We have seen earlier that given a uh, set of specifications uh, uh, of a large digital system, we can model it as a uh, uh, as as in the form of this particular architecture, as a form of a data path connected to a controller, or what we alternately alternatively called it as a RTL uh, picture of a digital system. And we had seen how, given a algorithm, uh, you know, if you if you're given specifications, you think of an algorithm for carrying out that particular. Uh, uh, for executing those specifications, and then you model it in terms of a data path, uh, a set of registers, muxes, adders, subtractors, multipliers, and, and a controller like this here. So that, that's the first part of the course that you saw that, uh, uh, that, that we did. And then uh, lately what we've been doing is, well, all these elements that you see here, whether it's an adder or a register or whatever, they're made up of elementary gates and we had seen design of these particular gates here. For example, an, a NAND gate or a NOR gate or more complex gates, we'd seen how one can take a gate like this, convert it into a transistor schematic, and how we can size each one of these. We had looked at the issues involved in sizes, and then we can take this particular gate and we can also carry out its layout. Right, but this is the layout of an elementary gate. What we need to do, as we have been saying, the design is complete only when you have the layout of the complete system. So what we need to do is, this is our complete system here. What we need to do is carry out layout of, these, of this complete system here. And the building blocks or the bricks of this particular system are what you see here is the gates. And this process of now taking these elementary gates, constructing an adder or a, uh, or a MUX or a register has to be carefully carried out. If you don't do that, you end up getting a very uh, bad layout with large interconnects and all that. So let me illustrate those problems and then look at how one can uh, do a full chip integration here. So uh, as an example one, suppose we have only two blocks. All right, we have, so we, are, we have only two blocks. And whatever the blocks are, this is a abstract discussion right now. So we have two blocks. And those two blocks are made up of gates and you've uh, you know, assembled all the gates. And the layout of the block A looks like this here, some 10 units. Whatever that units are, don't bother about it. So 10 units here and 10 units here. So there's a block A. Block A could be a multiplier or could be a register or whatever, right? So there's a block A that is there. There's a VDD pin here. There's a ground here. And let's say the block A has two sets of uh, c connections here. N1 is one set. It's not one connection. N1 could be a set of, it could be a bus, could be a set of eight lines and all that, and N2 is another one. So this is block A. And what I'm showing is a physical design. I'm not showing a logical design. So this, these are physical dimensions. This is where the location of uh, uh, pins N1 and N2 are. Similarly, let's say you have a block B. And block B also obviously has VDD ground and all that, and has N1 and N2. N1 and N2 meaning this N1 has to be connected to this N1, and this N2, these connections have to be connected to N2. So let's say you didn't think enough about the overall uh, chip layout. What you did was you had a block A or a multiplier, you took all the gates and assembled it together and you got something like this. And then you took block B, it could be a register or whatever, you assembled it together and you got a block B like this. Right, now you have to assemble them together. You have to connect them together. And so you start assembling A and B together and then you end up with this, right? You, you A is 10 by 10, B is 10 by five, you start assembling and you get an overall layout, which is like this here. Now, what is the problem with this? The unused space. You have unused space here and unused space here. That's one problem. So if you, if you don't carefully think about what the overall layout of my chip will look like, and you simply take various blocks, do the layout, and then in the end start connecting them up, 
you, you'll end up with problems like this. Unused space, long interconnect. Look at the wire here, N2 running. All, this is all over the chip, so it long interconnect. And overall aspect ratio is far from desired square. Normally when we have a full IC that is there, we are, we're looking for a sort of a square, close to a square so that we can fit in lots of these uh, ICs on one particular wafer here. So you have all these problems that are there. Why? Because not enough thought was given to how, what would end up after we connect these blocks together. How are we going to connect these different blocks together? No thought was given. A was uh, assembled independently. B was assembled with gates independently. And then in the end, you start connecting them together. And you see, obviously, a problem like this, right? A, a, some thought, if you give some thought to this particular process, that in the end, you'll have to take all these blocks and you'll have to connect them together, Maybe what could have done, what could have been done is a block like this A, one could have taken this block A and remodified the design in the sense that I know that A will have to be connected to B. So fine, VDD, ground and all that are here, N1 is here. I could also, through my layout, arrange that the output N is available on this side. I do the layout in such a way that the pins, the, the interconnections N2 are also available on this side. And similarly, I know that this has to be connected with this, so B, B's layout I can modify. I can modify by making a layout not 10 uh, width and 5 height, but I could make it 5 uh, width and 10 height, sort of preserving the uh, sort of area that is there. Because area would be dependent on how many gates and all that are there in design B. Right? So too, too much area you cannot play around. But aspect ratio you can, as I will show you later on. Okay? So you can have 5 here and 10 here, and you could have 10 here and 5 here. Aspect ratio you can play around but not so much as the area. Area depends on the complexity here. So now if you rearrange B in this particular form, A in this particular form, note that now I can interconnect A and B simply by putting them next to each other. I put them next to each other, VDD runs here, N1 and N1 here, N2 and ground in here. Note that no unused space, no long interconnects, all those problems are solved. Why? Because we gave thought to the process that eventually a block like this A will have to be connected to a block like B. And so when we carry out a layout of block A and we carry out a layout of block B, we arrange things in such a manner, their shapes, the shapes of uh, the blocks and the pin positions and all that, we arrange it in such a way that the interconnection becomes better, the, the space utilization becomes better. Yeah. So that particular process where you think of how you're going to take these different blocks, how are you going to assemble them together, that particular process is called the flow planning process. It's called the chip, whole chip planning process here. So all the major blocks that are there in the chip, you decide what their shapes are going to be, where are you going to place them, how are you going to interconnect, and all those, all those processes called the flow planning process here. Let me give you another example. Let's say you have three blocks in your, these are all abstract uh, examples just to illustrate some of the principles. So suppose you have these blocks here, A, B, and C here. Three blocks are there. This is a logical diagram. There's not a physical logical diagram showing that block A is connected to log block B through some wires, block B is connected to block C through wires, and block A is connected to block C wires. And based on the complexity of A, B, and C, you know that the comp area complexity is about 150 units in terms of gates. Let's say B is some 30 units, C is some 30 units here. How do we now carry out the flow planning process? Flow planning process is what uh, shape would A have, what shape would B have, what shape would C have, and how, how am I going to interconnect them? So note that I could potentially do something like this here. I could arrange A, its aspect ratio as 13 by 12, approximately as uh, 150, 13 by 12. C I could make 6 by 5, and B I could make 6 by 5, and, interconnect, and I could arrange them in this particular manner. Here. So all the interconnections that are there between B and A, so we will decide the pin positions and all that here. Uh, and similarly, whatever are, are over here. Similarly, the interconnection between B and C would be all here, and between C and A over here. So we could potentially try and create a layout like this. So what we are doing is now we said, we have, let's say we have planned this out, that uh, my block A is going to look like this, block B is going to look like this, block C. Now we go ahead and implement this particular block. We do the layout of this particular block using the gates and all that that we have, all right? We don't simply uh, have a block A and we start implementing it, as I said, without thought to what the overall layout is going to look like. So flow planning refers to giving 
thought and planning this particular picture. What aspect ratio of A, where are the pin positions of A, what aspect ratio of B, where are the pin positions and aspect ratio of C and pin positions and all that. All right? So, so you can see here one of the principles that we try to do is, as much as possible, if you have to make connections between the blocks, do that by putting them next to each other. That minimizes the, uh, any unused space and minimizes the length of the interconnect here. It's not always possible, but this is one of the uh, principles that you follow here. Let me show you another example. This is something similar to what we had done earlier. Again, uh, this, this example is, uh, uh, is, is close to a multiplier example here. So we have 4-bit input A, 4-bit input B, there is some start pin, VDD, ground. It's a sequential system, synchronous, there's a clock here, and there is an output. Uh, output is actually 8 bits, so first four, first 4 bits are put first, and then the next 4 bits are uh, put uh, after some time in this particular one. So it's like a multiplier example. The whole thing, you, if you count, is 16 pins. So eventually note that the 16 pins will have to, be, will have to fit into a 16-pin IC. So uh, the ICs are, as I said, the pins of the ICs are connected to these pads here. These are big metal pads and maybe a very fine gold wire will connect to this particular bag to the pin of the IC here. So this is what we call as the pad frame. These are pads, pads to which eventually they are connected to the uh, pins here. So this is the pad frame here. So we are wanting a 16 pin uh, uh, design. So 16 pins, we arrange it in this particular manner here as a ring. And each one of those pads, uh, they vary in length. For our discussion, let's take them as 100 micron by 100 micron. So you can see here, our overall IC for a 16 pin becomes 600 micron by 600 micron, or 6 millimeter, 0.6 millimeter by 0.6 millimeter. And if we translate that into lambda, <coughs> lambda for us is around 0.3, so it turns out that I have a space of around 1300 lambda by 1300 lambda. All right, so this is the space that is available, and these are the pins that are there. Now note that I, we will have to decide where am I going to put A. A is going to be here, here, where is A going to be, where is B going to be, where is start, where is VDD, ground, clock, all these pin positions we have to decide. And similarly, now the, uh, whatever are the elements of here, we have to decide where to place and how to interconnect and all that here. All right, so this is the, uh, the simple multiplier example as controller data path. The data path is here. We have seen these things, adders, multi uh, registers, multipliers, decrementer here, and the controller is uh, a, a, a two-state controller here. So what we need to do is we need to uh, implement this particular part on the chip that we just saw, that area that is available here, right? 1300 lambda by 1300 lambda here. Okay, now as I said, what we'll do is, uh, fine, we have this design with us, and we have to implement each one of them, adders, decrementers, and all these things we'll have to implement. And so what we do is, uh, we do our basic gates. So we have these gates here. Let's say you've gone ahead and we have done this here. Inverter is here, NAND2 is here, NAND3 is here. So I'm describing a very simple example where we use only a few gates. A NAND2 and a NAND3 and an inverter. That's it, we try and build everything using that. Uh, in a more realistic picture, you use a lot more other gates as well. But anyway, let's see, let's suppose we do, do, do this. Uh, we construct, note that we need a register, so we construct a D flip-flop. Uh, don't go, I will not go into the details of, of it. So this is an example of a positive edge uh, uh, D flip-flop. This is the layout here. So again, the example that I'm describing is, let's say somebody has done this. Somebody has uh, uh, done this front-end design, this RTL design, and then doesn't do a uh, flow planning process. And, 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 and you know, without doing the flow planning process, starts implementing using the gates here, all right? So the person uh, designs a D flip-flop, uses the layout of the gates that we just saw here, assembles all these gates and constructs a layout of a D flip-flop. Note that D flip-flop will be required to implement all these registers here, R3, R4, all of them are four bit registers. So D flip-flop is here. Similarly, there's a MUX2 uh, for, uh, for uh, you know, we, need, we have MUXs. Uh, here, uh, and so uh, this is a four bit mux, but it's a two is to one mux, right? Four bits, so uh, for four bits, this is a one for one bit. The input is uh, uh, one select input here, and x1 and x2, and uh, so there are four such you will have to connect them uh, in order to get a for a four bit uh, a number here. So let's say this is a mux, uh, there's a full adder here. 
Right, so this person is uh, taking a schematic of a full adder, assembling all the gates together, making a full adder. Again, without thought to, what will eventually happen? How, how do I interconnect all of them, right? Full adder here. So now this is what we have, a D flip-flop, flip-flop is this size here, Max is this size here, and a full adder is this size here, right? This is one element. Now note that to make a complete adder, I will have to take four such full adders and connect them in series, okay? So now the person takes and starts connecting them up. Uh, here, and, and the diagram looks similar to what the diagram is over here. So there is an R1 here, and there's a mux, so the person draws an R1 here and a mux. There's an R2 here, so R2 here. Adder becomes long and thin like this. R3 is here, mux is on top. R4 is here. You know, starts assembling and seeing, well, it starts, you know, you can begin to see problems that there are long interconnects, there are unused spaces. Obviously, there'll be problems because you never thought what would happen at the end when you assemble them together. And so, everything would start looking very odd, right? And, and, and so, uh, you know, as I said, the, you'll, have, you'll start facing problems in interconnections. You'll start getting unused spaces because you never thought of what should be the shape of this register. You never paid attention. You just took some D flip-flops, constructed some D flip-flop, put those D flip-flops together, four of them, and you end up with a register like this, right? Is this the optimum shape? Is this where the pin positions are supposed to be? No thought was given, so in the end, when you start assembling it, it starts looking like it. Uh, you start seeing a problem. Uh, uh, it, not a, it's, a, it's a poor layout due to lack, or it can be a very bad planning process also, but it is more like due to absence of any planning process. All right. Now, let me show you what one can do. If you don't go through the flow planning process and pay attention, then you'll end up with something like this. Let me take a part of this particular layout. This is what we are saying. If you don't do proper planning, look at this max, adder, and R, it would start looking like this. Here. This is my adder. This bigger adder is more complexity, so it's bigger. You can see here. This is my max here, and this is my register here. And when we typically ask uh, students to carry out a layout of a max, adder, and a register like this, this is a typical design that is produced. A, you know, a, a MUX is produced like this, an ADA, and, and, and wires are run, run around like this. Big wires that you see here, right? Going around, <coughs> going around like this. Uh, lots of problems, as you can see here. Unused space here, long wires here, all these that you see here. Well, if we pay attention, what can we do? Like this. Look at this layout. An optimum layout for uh, sort of an optimum layout for this, these three com combinations here, MUX, ADDER, and register here. What have we done? Look at that MUX. It's for, we know that MUX, ADDER, and register has been done. And each one of them is made up of, since it's a four-bit design, so we have four such cells that are there. So the MUX cell, the ADDER cell, and the register cell have all been matched in their pitch. The horizontal dimension here has been, have been matched. Registers. Uh, uh, adder and mux, and there are four such of them. And instead of running wires around like this here, the wires are all run through this, through the cells. You can create leave space within the cell so that you can run the wires. And even if you don't leave the space, remember you you have many layers of metal. Metal one, metal two, metal three, metal two can be used, metal three can be used, and all that here. So note how the how the connections are being made here. Uh, if if we look at uh, the connection between adder and register. This connection, the adder and register is directly connected here. I've just shown a, a purple line here, but all that we are saying is the pin positions of the adder output and the register input would be matched so that they just connect together. You don't really have to have anything, they just, you know, uh, if you put them adjacent, the connections are made here. The connection between the uh, register, you see the register and the mux, the connection between the register and the mux here is going like this. And here, the, this is the register. So the output of the register, the pin is placed here, and it, it goes through this particular cell, and it goes into the MUX. So the input pin of the MUX is placed here. And, and the wire goes through this and connects it here. So the, note that the interconnections are being made through the cells. They're not being made around the cells here. All right, by leaving, uh, by carrying out layout in this particular manner here. And similarly, the other, other, uh, other connections that you see here are connections to the adder, one connection to the adder, so it goes like this through this one here. So note, compare this particular layout versus this particular layout. 
So the point is, if you do the flow planning process, now you know that register, I need to carry out the register, uh, a D-flip flop, this is a D-flip flop. I need to carry out the design of a D-flip flop such that its horizontal dimension matches the horizontal dimension of the adder and also matches the horizontal dimension of the mux. All the horizontal dimensions have to match. And not only that, it tells you where should be the, for the D-flip flop, where should be the output, where should be the input. So where, which are the input and the output pin positions here. So those things get decided. Now after doing this, now you go ahead and implement the D-flip flop with the constraint that the horizontal dimensions of all of these things have to match. And the pin positions have been defined. Now you go do the layout. And, and once you do the layout, naturally after that assembling would be straightforward and you'll get a uh, proper layout of the overall chip here. So what does flow planning uh, basically is? It refers to the planning of the layout of the complete chip. The goals of flow planning are, uh, the aim is all the major blocks that are there, arrange the blocks on the chip. Where are you going to place which blocks, right? Uh, so that's what you're saying. Where A, A is going to be placed here, B is going to be placed here, C is going to be placed here. Uh, and uh, uh, while deciding where you're going to place, you're also deciding sort of the aspect ratio of the blocks. What the dimension, I mean, what the aspect ratio is going to be. As I said, the overall area you cannot play around too much because once the A is decided, the number of gates is decided, so overall area is roughly fixed, but aspect ratio you can play around with. So you decide how are you going to arrange the blocks, what their aspect ratios are going to be, where the pin positions of A and B, C, and all that are there. Then you have to decide the location of the input output pads. As we said, the complete chip is surrounded by the pad ring and where are the input output pins of, uh, of the chip that you're going to decide here. Uh, decide the location, I've not talked about it, later on we'll decide the location and number of power pads. Where are you going to bring in VDD and ground into the uh, system here? Because know that whichever pin you're using to bring VDD in, VDD has to go to everywhere in the system. Ground that you bring in has to go everywhere in the system. Clock has to go everywhere in the system. So where, where are you going to distribute your clock, VDD and all that from there? Uh, uh, that's what power distribution network, VDD and ground, uh, the clock distribution network. So all these things you're doing at the time of flow planning, deciding how you're going to do all of these things here. Uh, flow planning, as, as, as I just said, is carried out prior to detailed layout. You, we do this flow planning, uh, all this process, that once we do that, then we know how to do the layout of the blocking. All right? Uh, some flow planning uh, tips that we've already seen, cells should be connected. You know, you're doing an 8-bit or a 16-bit or a 32-bit, so you're made up of cells, and the cells should be connected by abutment rather than by running wires. Rather than by running wires, you do that by just putting them next to each other. Uh, to do this, cells are stretched so that they match in pitch. Now note that MUX's complexity is different from ADDER. ADDER's complexity is different from register, uh, but you're going to match the pitch here, the horizontal of each one of them. All right, uh, okay. It's also useful to impose some discipline on the direction of flow of information. For example, in a data path controller architecture, we have data signals and we have control signals. So you may, imp you know, you may impose some regularity on your layout by saying all the data signals, data signals are all going to run horizontally <coughs> and all the control signals are going to run vertically. And you can decide this is going to run on M2, this is going to run on M1. So I these initial decisions will help you uh, later to ca carry out the detail layout. You know that metal to all these, all these lines, uh, data signals are all going to come like this. All the control signals are going to come like this. So it will help you in carrying out the layout of the individual elements that are there here. Uh, again, it's the same uh, picture. Arrange the blocks in such a way that routing space required is minimum and interconnect length. Many times you cannot uh, connect them right next to each other, adjacent to each other. So in that case, if I have a block ABC, you don't connect them like this. Some of these things are common sense. Uh, th these are, this is a little better, but perhaps this is better. So you arrange your block ABC in such a manner here uh, so that the interconnect lengths are uh, minimized, the unused spaces are minimized and all that. Okay, let me take the same example and then uh, go through a proper layout of this particular example. Here. All right, so we had uh, uh, a proper flow, uh, af after carrying out a proper flow planning process here. So we had this data path here. A controller I've not shown, controller is a two-state controller here. So we had this data path uh, with these registers and all that. 
Now what I'm doing is I'm breaking this data path into two uh, sub data paths. This is sub data path one, and this is data path two. You can see that they are also logically separate. This part is not interconnected to this part. All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, show you how to carry out the layout of this, this whole sub data path and then of this particular path here, okay? Again, this is a 16 pin. We have to fit it in this, within this path frame here. All right, so the sub data path that you see here, I'm going to do it in this particular manner here. Note, uh, note that R2, uh, MUX2, R3, ADDER, and R4, all these elements are arranged one on top of each other. And, uh, and, and the cell sizes of the D flip flop, the MUX, and the ADDER will all be made the same. The pitch will be made the same. And you can see how the connections are being made here. So MUX connection to R3. MUX connection to R3, you can see here. Uh, and, and, and all the other connections, ADDER and R4, you can see here. And R4 is connected to uh, MUX, oh, sorry, ADDER is connected to uh, the MUX here. Here, so adder is connected, the adder output is connected to the MUX here. And uh, what else? Uh, so all the uh, interconnections that you see here, they're all made through the cells here. All right, so we are going to carry out the layout of, of this particular sub data path in this particular manner. Here. All right, okay. Uh, the other part of the data path, we are going to carry out in a similar manner here. The MUX R1 decrementer uh, and the OR gate is a four bit, four input OR gate. So all of uh, for these bits, individual bits uh, ORing is to be done. So we do it all in this particular manner. Okay, so finally what we are going to do is arrange in our chip the bigger <coughs> data path, sub data path one, sub data path two. Controller is relatively simple. Let's say we are going to arrange it like this. And, and this is how the information is going to flow. The input B is going to come from here. The input A is going to come from here. The output Z is going to come from here. Uh, right, so let's start with the adder. Note that all, all of these, keep in mind, all of them will have to be mashed in pitch. So let's start with an adder, very simple adder, which we call as the ripple carry adder. So it's made up of one bit adder cells. Uh, each one bit adder is, uh, is what we call as a full adder. So its true table is here. One can write down the sum part. The sum part is nothing but the XOR of A, B, and the input carry. And we can carry out, we can write down the carry output, uh, the carry output here, uh, carry output here, uh, in this form here, and we can implement in this particular form. There are uh, many ways of implementing an adder, so we can implement it in this 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 whole thing that you see here, a sum part, and the C out can be implemented in this particular gate form here. All right. Now the issue is, remember, we have to assemble the full adder cell here. Now wh what am I writing here? So. In, in, in my simple design, everything is going to be implemented using inverters, NAND gates, two input NAND gate, and three input NAND gates. That's all. We are deliberately not using anything else here. So XOR gate, note that XOR gate is here. XOR gate is here. It requires four two input NAND gates, one, two, three, four here. That's why I've written one, two, four. We need another XOR gate, uh, which is six to nine NAND gates here. Uh, for uh, this thing. So this A, B, C in produces the sum output here. And then the remaining produce the C out here. Right, so the NAND that, that one has built has a NAND gate. Now note that NAND gate also can be built with different aspect ratio. But suppose the aspect ratio is 30 by 34 lambda. 30 by 34 lambda. And now we have to construct the layout of this, this whole thing here, of this uh, full adder cell here. Now, one way of constructing the layout is, what we are talking about, you can construct in many different ways. What we are talking about is a layout where there is a well-defined structure. In structure in the sense that, look, I'm going to only place NAND gates. So the whole thing is made up of NAND gates. Uh, you, you can see here it's made up of 11 NAND gates. So I'm going to arrange the NAND gates in rows. I can have a row of NAND gates here. I can have another row of NAND gates here. And I'll use the space in between to interconnect the NAND gates and all that. You know, one NAND gate is connected to the next and all that. The space in between is used for interconnecting. So what we are talking about is a very structured way of doing it. Now, there's nothing which is telling us that I have to arrange them in a row. You may not arrange them in a row. You may arrange them in whatever fashion that you want, depending on how, they, how the interconnection has to be done. But to make things simple and to make things regular, what we do is we arrange 
rows of NAND gates here. Now, <coughs> note that I can do, uh, there are 11 of them, and I can have two rows here, two rows of NAND gates, six of them here, and another five here. We can leave an empty cell also. Uh, that's not a problem. This empty cell could be in between anywhere here. Yeah. And the length of a NAND gate is 30. So 30 into 6, we'll end up with one, 180. The overall width of my uh, uh, full adder is going to be 180. 180. And this 180, note that this is 180 of one cell, and then I put four of them in series, right, to make a f complete uh, four-bit adder here. So it will end up becoming 720. So it's good, it will it, it end up becoming 720 lambda in size, and, you know, 30... 4 is the width here, 34 is the width here, some space has to be left for wiring and all that connecting them up. So let's say this is around 80. Uh, one doesn't have a fixed number as yet. Until you do the layout, you don't know exactly what, what the uh, length of this, uh, this, this thing is there, height is there. But the width we are sure, because we know this is 30, so width is about close to uh, 180 here. Now is that the optimum one? I don't know. Should I arrange all these uh, NAND gates? Uh, six of them in a row and six of them in a row, I, I do not know because there are other possibilities. I could also do uh, four, four, four. I can also do this one. I can arrange the NAND gates in three rows. Four of them here, four of them here, four of them here. Use the space in between for doing that. Now the pitch of this uh, full adder cell becomes 120 lambda. Is that, uh, should I do three in a, uh, like this? Should I do like this? Or there's another possibility if you want. You can arrange all of them in one row. All right, is that the right way of doing the uh, f uh, full adder layout? Well, let's see. Ultimately, who decides which is the right way of doing layout? Well, we have to remember, eventually construct the full layout. And the pitch of the adder should match the pitch of the, uh, the, uh, the D flip flop and should match the pitch of the marks here. So we have to match all of them together, right? So we know that these possibilities are there. But let's look at the other one. D flip-flop is here. D flip-flop, as you can see here, is made up of, uh, I'm not going into the details, you can, a yeah, positive edge triggered flip-flop, you can pick it up from any particular book and you can verify that it acts like a positive edge triggered flip-flop here. So it has lots of these three input NAND gates that you see here. Five of them three input NAND gate, one of them is a two input NAND gate here. This is a three input NAND gate. Layout of three input NAND gate, 39 lambda into 34 lambda. And now we could arrange our D flip flop in this manner here. Three of them here and three of them here. I think all of them have been mentioned, NAND3. Uh, one of them you can, uh, you know, you can take a NAND2 also. And NAND2 was uh, 30, but you can stretch it to become 39 also. All right? So NAND2 was 30 lambda, but you can stretch it and make it 39 lambda. So that's not a problem here. All right, so we could arrange a D flip flop in these two rows and then uh, the pitch comes out to be 120. Now that's nice because it, then 120 here and 120 here. These sort of match together. So, uh, so far it appears that maybe I can arrange this uh, full adder cell in uh, these three rows of four NAND gates. And similarly, my D flip flop, I'll arrange it, the six uh, NAND gates that are there, I'll arrange in two rows of three each and use the space in between. So, and then these D flip flops, putting them next to each other, will make a register here. So we could do that. Let's come to the MUX. The MUX is very simple. And it has only these three NAND gates and an inverter. One cell of uh, this thing. Uh, NAND2, we've already seen 30 lambda. What we could do is we could arrange them in a row. In, in one single row, the MUX can be arranged here. NAND2, 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 NAND2 here, and inverter, as I said, can be stretched to become also 30. You can leave some space, empty space here in the inverter. So this can also become 120. So it appears to us that 120 maybe is the normal pitch. If I, if I implement my marks in this particular manner with 120 lambda here, then all of them seem to be about the same dimensions here, right? So one should be able to implement in this particular form here. So now, having implemented the, each one of these uh, MUX cells, uh, you can go ahead and now make the full adder. So now you start implementing the full adder now. So this shows a full adder here. You can see now there is a, a NAND gate here, there's a NAND gate here, there's a NAND gate here, NAND gate here, and all that that you can see. That's how the NAND gates have been arranged in these three rows. And spaces have been used for interconnecting. 
Well, each, this comes out to be 137 lambda into 159 lambda here. Not exactly 120, some space extra has been used to interconnect and all that. So this is full atom. Then you go ahead and do a mux. Mux, we said, all of them are in a row. So note that all of them we put in a row. And we arrange the pitch also 137 lambda into 46 lambda here. So this is now a complete mux here. Uh, 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 one element of a mux. One element of a mux, right? We have, uh, it's a, a four is to one, so we need to put multiple. D flip flop is here. We said we'll arrange them in two rows. So two rows are here. And in between space has been used for uh, interconnects. Decrementer I've not shown, so decrementer is here. Now this is a complete four bit register. One D flip flop here, another here, another here, another here. Uh, four D flip flops. This is a, a four bit mux, one here, one here, one here, one here. Four muxes are here. Uh, you know, one of the, so this is for one bit, this is for the second bit, third bit, and the fourth bit here. This is a four bit adder. One, 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 one here. This is a four bit decrementer. Now, let's see the whole sub data path. So you arrange them, remember how you're gonna arrange one on top of each other? This is how it looks like. 553 lambda into 684 lambda. So, I mean, it, uh, you know, so if you go step by step, if you just look at it, it looks complex, but you go step by step, it's not that complex, okay? So this is our sub data path one. You assemble them and you get the entire uh, sub data path one. This, this part, this part looks like here, sub data part two. Now you assemble them all, this is the controller part here, I've not shown, I've not gone into the details here. And then you assemble them again. So th that's how your overall chip may look like, so you'll have to have B going interconnects like this. Uh, f for us the entire, uh, in fact the area available is, is much larger than what I really need. So they, you can't help it, you have empty spaces there because your design is very simple. So th such designs that are called are, they are pad limited design. In the sense that you have 16 pins and 16 pins are all arranged in a ring like this, so they give you a certain area. But your, but your design doesn't require that much area. So these designs are called pad limited. If you want, you now in this case, now you can go ahead and see, maybe you can put some extra things. <laughs> you, you have space available here, you can put some extra things here, extra things here, and all that. Right, so I've just taken you in a very simple manner how you go and uh, uh, do a flow planning process and how you craft the individual cells and how you assemble them, and then finally you create a, uh, a full chip uh, 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 layout like this here. All right.